with a story uh, that is a true story, uh, indeed. Uh, and I want to tell it particularly because there are so many uh, women uh, who are watching this evening. Uh, and also, it's particularly appropriate uh, at a time when so many uh, airlines are really suffering and possibly we're even wondering uh, if some will go under and not survive that I should tell this particular story. And it begins on a sunny afternoon in June uh, in 1930. Uh, and a woman uh, went out window shopping uh, along Bond Street, which is a rather upmarket uh, street in London. Uh, and to her surprise, she saw in a window, there was a plane. And the sign by the plane said, Blackburn Bluebird, ready to fly. You could fly anywhere, 500 pounds. And Mildred, that was her name, she went into the shop and sensing an opportunity, she said to the salesman, is that true? You could fly anywhere? Yes, ma'am. Uh, could you fly around the world? And the man said, oh, yes, ma'am. You see, the wings fold up. Well, Mildred, who'd never been on an aeroplane, this was 1930, didn't know much about planes, but the one thing she did know was that you needed to have wings in order to fly. Uh, yes, indeed, ma'am. Uh, but you see, uh, this plane is too small. It'll get you across the English Channel, but it would never carry you across the Atlantic, let alone the Pacific. So the wings are designed to fold up so that you can put it into a crate, load it on the deck of a ship and sail across the ocean, unpack it and then carry on your trip. And we'll just sit there. And she wrote out a cheque for £500, uh, plus a little extra for maps and charts and uh, probably some nice... Mm, uh, pilot's goggles uh, and a nice flying cap, of course, uh, and uh, went home and told her husband that uh, uh, no, she hadn't bought a dress, she'd bought an aeroplane and that she was going to fly around the world and be the first person to do that solo. Well, I'd have loved to have sat in on that conversation and hear how Victor Bruce, her husband, responded to that because 500 pounds in 1930 was an awful lot of money. But to his credit, because he himself was also a speedster and a record setter. He'd met Mildred when they were both competing in the London to Monte Carlo rally a couple of years earlier. And he supported and encouraged her, and very sensibly, he actually gave her a compass so that she would never get lost. She had the plane uh, sent to Heston Field, which was a tiny, tiny airstrip, literally in the middle of a big farmer's field, just outside London. It's a bit larger now, it's called... Um, he throw. Hmm. Uh, and she arranged to have some flying lessons. At the end of the first week, uh, she got her went, did first solo flight. At the end of a month, she got her pilot's license. And two months after first stepping into the cockpit, she set off, never having flown more than 40 miles on a single trip, on her round the world journey of more than 19,000 miles. What did she take with her? Well, she had, uh, apart from her husband's compass, in a shoulder bag, uh, she had uh, just a passport, a logbook. Uh, she had uh, a couple of summer frocks and an evening dress because she was determined, having spent the day uh, flying in this oak cockpit and with all the wind and the, the filth from the engine, the fumes and the oil, that when she arrived in the exotic capitals of the far flung outposts of the British Empire and the French colonies, she wanted to be able to live it up and to be a woman. She also brought with her a dictaphone because this was in the days long before uh, digital voice recorders and of course, Twitter and Instagram. This was a rather large, heavy and bulky piece of equipment with a sort of long tube-like microphone that you held rather like the old days of a telephone. It was very heavy. So in order to be able to put it on the plane, what didn't she bring with her? A parachute. Hmm. Mildred flew around the world without the safety net of a parachute. And to explain that, perhaps I need to give you a better idea of what sort of plane she was actually flying in. Something rather like this. Only 30 feet wingspan, uh, 23 feet from propeller to tail, and only nine feet high. It was a uh, twin-seater, uh, open cockpit. Uh, that's why it was called the honeymoon model. The idea was that the instructor would sit beside the trainee uh, in, as they were learning to fly. 
Mildred ripped out that other seat and put in a spare fuel tank, gave her an extra 90 gallons that she could actually fly a little bit further without having to run. The only other modification she made to the plane was to have an extra propeller put underneath the fuselage. So why didn't she need a parachute? Because whereas nowadays planes can virtually fly themselves, going from one beacon to another, in those days, you relied on the three R's of aerial navigation, railways, rivers, and roads. She had to stay below the cloud clapper in order to see where it was she was actually going. And so therefore, a parachute would have been no use to her because it would have opened by the time that she actually hit the ground. And because she was so determined to actually follow what was on the ground, that was her first near miss, she was approaching Belgrade and uh, following a steam engine that was kind of puffing along a valley. Uh, and she was so engrossed watching the train that when it went round a sort of a bend in the valley and she banked and followed around, to her dismay, she saw the, play, the train was disappearing into a tunnel. And in front of her, there was this massive cliff of rock. So fortunately, she managed to pull back and climb and just in time managed to clear the hilltop uh, and zoomed over some poor Serbian shepherd, I gather, giving him a shock as she zoomed over him and his flock. Her first real problem was a few days later when she was flying over the Persian Gulf and unfortunately she flew into a sandstorm which caused some serious damage to her engine and also to complicate matters at that moment her fuel pipe developed a leak so she's watching her fuel gauge kind of uh, 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 and suddenly this propeller this really noisy propeller that was just two meters in front of her stopped. Can you imagine? From that noise, there's silence. There's just the sound of the wind as it coming through the struts and she mm -hmm. is losing altitude. The sea is below her, the land is in the distance and she's losing altitude, ghosting, ghosting. Ahead of her, she sees what seems to be a dried up lake or mud flat. Unfortunately, she manages to land on that and just as she thinks, good, I've landed, I'm safe. The, the weight of the plane drives the wheels through the mud into the soft mud underneath. And the plane went from 90 miles an hour to zero like that, upended, and she smashed her head on the front of the cockpit. Fortunately, it wasn't um, serious. She was only unconscious for a short while. Uh, Mildred built a very stern of stuff. Uh, got herself out, took her water flask and her husband's compass and set off and managed to find some uh, traveling nomads who brought her to an outpost of the British Empire, uh, a radio signal station in what is present day Iran. Uh, and they came back and managed to uh, switch the uh, propeller because the original was now already bent out of shape, uh, put, fitted the replacement. And by taking a uh, one meter length of garden hose pipe, from the uh, base's uh, garden hose were able to fix the fuel leak. Mildred then flew on through Karachi, Calcutta, uh, Rangoon to Bangkok. I didn't come down to Singapore, unfortunately. Uh, while she was in Bangkok, the French commissar organized a tiger hunt in her honor. Uh, and from there, she flew north up to Hanoi, where to mark the fact that she was the very first person to fly solo from London to Hanoi, they gave her a medal, the medal of 1,000 elephants and the white umbrella. Unfortunately, I can't tell you the significance of the white umbrella, but I'm sure it is quite considerable. From there, she flew on to Shanghai, where she intended to fly to Japan. But unfortunately, at that moment, the emperor decided to come out from the palace to inspect his troops. This was 1930, remember? 31 now. Um, uh, and there was a law in Japan that no one was allowed to be uh, higher than the emperor when he was out of the palace. And so she flew across the Yellow Sea, a really magnificent flight of 600 miles uh, to Seoul. Uh, and then a couple of days later, when his Imperial Majesty had returned to the palace, uh, she was able to fly to Tokyo and recorded on her amazing uh, dictaphone that she had spectacular views of Mount Fuji as she flew past. And when she landed in Tokyo, she was presented with a pearl necklace from Mrs. Mikimoto herself. 
uh, her plane uh, was, as the salesman had promised, uh, had the wings folded, uh, put in a crate, and put on the deck of an ocean liner, and she sailed across the Pacific. On reaching Vancouver two weeks later, she then flew south towards San Francisco, and from there across the States to New York. When she arrived in New York, I love this, she actually flew her plane, it was so small, she flew it along Broadway, she flew it around the Empire State Building, and when she went over the, the harbor, over the Statue of Liberty, she actually did a loop the loop, which didn't go down well apparently with the natives. And when she landed in LaGuardia, the police officer arrested her. However, uh, she managed to um, talk her way out of that, uh, and again, uh, the wings were folded up, uh, and put into a crate on the deck of uh, a French ship, which brought her across the Atlantic back to Cherbourg in France. And the reason she went there was because Mildred Bruce was determined to fly back into England, which she did. Uh, and when she returned, uh, she had a guard of honor with uh, Amy Johnson and Winifred Spooner, two other uh, great British uh, aviatrices who gave her this uh, guard of honor to fly back into Croydon. The whole trip took her five months. And I wish I could say that she did actually then set the record of being the very first person to fly around the world solo. Uh, unfortunately, she was beaten to it by an Austrian count. I managed to do it about three weeks before she did. Uh, but by the time she died in 1990, Mildred held, had held 17 different speed world records, not only in aeroplanes, but also cars, which were her first love, and then speedboats before she graduated to planes. And when I tell this story, for me it's a very special story, uh, I actually give it two morals. And so to, I think John is the only other guy who's um, uh, on this uh, session this evening. So to the men, uh, I say that when the woman in your life, uh, be that your a wife or your daughter, uh, comes to you with some amazing dream, remember Vincent Bruce, okay? Support, embrace, and encourage her. But remember, do give her your compass. Not only that she'll never get lost, but she'll know how to find her way back home. And to all of you women who are listening to the story, I say to you this. It's important that when you have a dream, that you do spread your wings and try to fly really high. But if occasionally that you find yourself grounded and that you have to fold your wings, don't give up because I'm sure you can find another way to keep going forward and still reach your destination. And that's the story of Mildred Bruce.